Hey, thanks for choosing to click and watch the video. I make them out of a passion for sharing knowledge and experience and building community, but it's still a big investment in time, resources, and effort to plan, shoot, edit, and post them. If you feel that knowledge, time, and effort have value, you can help keep them coming by contributing. And I've put a link to Zelle and PayPal in the description below. There will also be links to the other parts in the video series and a list of the basic tools I used for the entire project. I hope it's helpful. Now on with the show. Now, before we do anything with the nut at all, we need to check the alignment of the neck and the frets because a guitar is truly the sum of its parts and that's going to have a direct effect on the nut later. So we're looking at basically three things. We're looking at any warp in the neck. We're checking that the frets have been leveled and then we're checking finally for the proper amount of relief. And that all needs to happen while the strings are on the guitar at tension. So first of all, warp. Now, warp can happen in two directions. Um, you can have the neck twisting from side to side because of, well, because of a lot of things. Uh, the climate, the way your guitar is stored, uh, and ultimately the tension of the strings across from the bottom to the top strings. Um, and so that technically is called torque. And simply a, a way to check that is to just sight up down the length of the neck from the nut to the saddle. Um, and you wanna be focused on the frets. You don't wanna be looking at the nut or the saddle because if those are set up properly, they're actually tilted on an angle like this. Um, and that's because the bottom strings, the bass strings, the heavier thick wound strings have a greater range of vibration or what we call like an oscillating pattern uh, than the thinner, lighter strings down here. So to compensate for that, we're elevating the nut and the saddle just a little bit higher than on the top thin strings. Um, so we want to look at the frets and we just want to make sure that the frets appear, you know, parallel as you go all the way down and that none of them as you go down are starting to tilt this way or tilt that way. If you kind of compare this fret to the middle down towards the 12th or the joint at the body. So we're sighting up this way. If you want to be you know, really doubly careful, you can even come down at the saddle and you can sight up that way as well. All right, so we're just looking for nothing too obvious that really stands out to us. Now for bow, you can usually check for really significant bowing in the neck just by looking down, you know, at the neck from the sides and just look, you know, at the plane of the strings to the neck and fingerboard and you should be able to see any obvious warp um, going up or back. Um, if you want to do a little bit finer point check you can just turn the guitar sideways and what you want to do is just sight up down the length of the neck this way and that usually highlights any significant dip or rise um, in the middle of the neck. Now as far as fret level and relief are concerned, um, and I'll explain relief in just a minute, um, but uh, they seem a bit contrary to each other, but they are related. And um, folks say, and it's true, that to actually check the level of the frets correctly, you need to um, basically make sure that the neck is adjusted so that there's absolutely zero dip in either direction, uh, that it's dead flat, perfectly flat. Um, and I mean, that that's pretty true. That's ideally the best way to check that the frets are all perfectly level. Um, but, you know, if you have the proper amount of relief, it's going to be so minimal that you should be able to get by with, with checking it with relief in the neck 
before you go and you know readjust your truss rod from where maybe it's perfectly fine. Um, in any event, to check the level, basically you just want a ruler. Now they make special tools that actually go the complete distance of the fingerboard. You should be able to get by with just your standard, you know, 12 inch ruler. Um, a metal ruler is better or, or you know, good um, sturdy plastic ruler. Um, basically, you want to make sure that there's no chance that it's warped itself, that, you know, you've got a true straight edge and that there's no, you know, major dents or anything that are going to, you know, corrupt that, that nice clean straight edge. So basically, you can just lay your ruler down across in contact with the frets. And of course, you're going to do the upper frets. And then there's just going to be overlap, which is a good thing when you go down to the lower frets. Um, and you're just making sure you can just sight up even, or you could take a slip of paper and see if it goes between the top of a fret and your ruler at any point along the way. But basically you're looking that all of the tops of the frets meet that edge, you know, equally, right? So there's no obvious gaps or it isn't raising the ruler up a little bit in either direction. So if you do that pretty much on your bottom side, dead in the middle, and at the top side, and of course, upper frets, lower frets, should be good to go there. Um, another thing that you can go ahead and do, you do need a little bit of specialized equipment for this though. Um, and I am not, really promoting or shilling here, but I will say that this string action gauge um, by that maker is extremely handy. Uh, and I mean, if you just look at it and you know even the basics about guitar, you're already going to see how much valuable information there is on this thing. So you've got automatically you've got some possible string action heights for you know, various instruments and various weights of your strings. Um, on both sides, you've got your measurement in inches and um, what we got here, decimals. And then we got, I think we've got metrics. Yep, on the other side, we've got metrics. Um, you've got basically every essential measurement you need to make on your guitar is on this thing. And you got a nice, little handy reference guide for sort of, you know, ideal average action. Let's see if I can get this thing to focus. There we go. So, I mean, for an electric, for an acoustic, and even for bass, I mean, come on, how handy is that? Now, what a lot of people don't realize about this is this also works really well to check the level of frets locally. And what I mean by that is that you're measuring or checking three frets at a time to make sure that none of the frets are a skosh higher than the others. And so what you've got here are these different lengths that you can do that with, right? So your lower frets that are spread further apart, obviously you've got them covered right there. Um, when you get toward the middle, you can turn this on its side and you're spanning your three frets that way. And of course, as you get up to the upper frets that are really, really tightly spaced together, there you go, you've got them covered. So this thing is pretty cleverly thought out and made, and it's a good sturdy gauge of metal. Um, it's also handy for checking, uh, possibly checking relief, um, but we'll talk about that in a second. So basically what you're doing and again, this kind of helps you to check just locally that there's nothing going on with the, uh, with the level of your frets, especially if you do have a little relief in the middle, um, is you rest that edge across three frets and you're basically giving some pressure forward and back against the middle fret. Now, if everything is level, 
it shouldn't move at all. It should sit flat against those three frets. If you did have the middle fret in any group of three, if you had the middle fret being a touch higher, then obviously you'd have like a seesaw effect that you'll not only see, but you'd also hear because it would literally tap from end to end against the outer frets. So then you'd know there's a problem there. And I mean, a fret can rise up on one end, on the other end, they could even bow in the middle. And so again, you wanna check at the top end, the middle, and at the bottom end, and you wanna overlap, right? So you wanna go these three, then to the next fret, these three, next fret, these three, next fret, and so on. And of course, rotating it. Okay, and finally, relief. So, relief is basically intentionally putting a very, very, very slight bow up, which is to say that the ends of the fingerboard are going up and that the middle of the fingerboard dips down. And I mean, we're talking slightly, and we'll talk about that number in a minute. Um, the reason for that is, and again, this depends um, on a lot of variables, um, the biggest one being your playing style. So what you need to remember is the vibrating or oscillating pattern of the strings. So your strings are contacting the guitar at the knot and at the saddle. And those are the points where the tension is the greatest, right? The string is held down, cinched down tight against the saddle and against the nut by the you know, tuning pegs. Um, so that means that the loosest point of the string is in the middle. That's where the string is free to vibrate the most it's going to vibrate. And the way the string vibrates, because the tension is so high and tight at the ends and loosest in the middle, that means it's going to you know, strum and hit, pick a string. You're sending it into an oscillating pattern. So you're starting out because you're, you know, you're strumming sideways. You're starting it out as a sideways motion, but then, of course, the strength of the tension takes over and that brings it into more of a vertical to the fingerboard motion. So basically you're setting up like an elliptical pattern that it would look like um, an American football or rugby ball. Um, the pattern would look like that as the string is vibrating with very, very, very little to minimal to no vibration at the points of contact to the widest point of vibration in the middle, all right? So think about that, right? Think about that shape. And what does that tell you about the level of your frets to the string as it's vibrating? Ah, ah, you see it coming? Yep. If you don't want that vibrating string to be bouncing against your middle frets and buzzing, you need to give a little relief to those frets, right? To the neck, to allow for the space that that string needs to vibrate freely until it finally comes back to rest, right? Okay, so. There you go. That's neck relief. Now, to check it, uh, there's a couple, uh, a couple of ways you could do it. Um, I'll put up a, a picture um, that shows a little bit of uh, contortionism here. So you can do it with two hands, um, or you can do it with just uh, a capo, or capo, depending on which English you speak, um, at the first fret. And then you're pressing the string down at the fret where the neck joins the body, okay? And then you wanna take the measurement of the distance between the top of the eighth fret 
and we're talking about the top of it, so right on top of the metal fret there, to the string, right? Remember, with the string pressed down at the first fret and the fret where it joins the body, right? So basically, you can do that with any average business card because the business card is the right thickness. Um, basically, you're looking for anywhere from point, what is it, point oh oh eight to which is about point two millimeters to point oh one two uh, inches, which is point three millimeters. Um, pretty sure my numbers are correct there. And so basically, if you slip a business card at the eighth fret on top of that fret, and you just check that there's not much movement, should be nice and snug, or at least very, very, very little movement. Here I've got my actions a little bit higher right now. Um, of course, you know, that can change later when I cut my new nut. Um, but again, I tend to play a little bit heavy, so, you know, I'm banging away at the strings. I mean, come on, it's a peak guitar, so you gotta do some windmills. Um, so, of course, if you're banging away, that means the strings are gonna be vibrating a lot more wildly, which means they need a little bit more space, so it's not a bad thing to be a little bit over. If you have a soft touch, um, you can go, you know, much lower without fear of buzz. And then uh, come over to the top of the string, same thing, slip the card in, check your measurement, and you should be good to go. Checking the frets are level and the neck has the proper amount of relief are both fundamental to filing the slots to the right height on your nut later, and you'll need to deal with any issues that come up after each of those stages. But since the focus of this video is replacing the nut, I'll follow up with a primer on managing both of those in a separate video later and put a link to it here in the description. So be sure to check back. Okay, we've checked the alignment of our neck and frets. We've taken all the useful measurements we can on our old nut. So we're ready to pretty much lift the strings and take that truss rod cover off and uh, start getting that nut off. So you'll notice I said lift up the strings and not take them off necessarily. Um, that's because you're gonna need to have strings back on to check the final depth of each slot in the nut um, to make sure that the string is at the proper height in the nut. Otherwise, you either cut the nut too high, uh, not low enough, the string is gonna be up too high. When you fret, it's gonna be a sharp note. Um, if you've got it too low, then, you know, obviously it's sitting on the frets and of course you're going to get buzz. Um, so the ultimate check is to put a string back in that slot and test it, you know, up points along the neck. Um, so, you know, some people don't want to waste a perfectly good set of strings that are on there. Uh, other people don't want to, you know, keep a set of strings on after they've been lifting it up and putting it back in and, you know, loosening, tightening, tuning, detuning, all that stuff. So, um, you know, you could do that. It just means you're going to have to sacrifice a set of strings, or we could try to just lift the strings up temporarily and put them back down. Um, now, to do that, more or less easy depending on your tailpiece. So um, on this one, we've got the Accent Vibrato tailpiece. Um, and so this one is pretty easy. It's actually the easiest option um, because you've got that channel that the ball ends of the strings drops into. And then you've got a little slot where the string then pulls, the, the ball end pulls in forward to, you know, of course, secure it in place. Um, so you just want to make sure you've got at least four wraps around each post, um, more or less, depending on the thickness of the strings, enough for you to be able to loosen the string and lift it out of the slot, out of the channel, 
and then you're going to basically just, you know, lift all the strings forward and let them, you know, just hanging off the headstock here out of your way. Um, pretty much more or less the same thing if you've got the R tail piece, except that the R tail piece, um, these slots are underneath. So you're still going to have to back the string out, but now you're going to need to um, unhook it from underneath behind and get it out. So it's a little bit more fiddly. Um, if you've got the tailpiece like the um, model 660 or the 36012 uh, C63 or V64, um, the, you know, basically the George Harrison model, it's got kind of like the chevron shape. Um, that's an issue because that doesn't have a slot to drop the strings in. Um, there, you're actually threading the strings through holes in the top plate, and there's no getting the ball end off of that plate. Um, so what you have to do there, obviously, is either just remove the strings, and if you can, try to do it cleanly enough and, and keep the ends where you could conceivably try to thread them back through and wrap them again. It's not ideal, but uh, it could be done. Um, or actually, the design is actually made for this. Um, on that tailpiece, you'll notice that on the back, there are two hooks that are on a base plate that goes behind the tailpiece, right under it, against the, you know, the, the wood body. Um, and then the tailpiece has two slots that basically, you know, slip over those two hooks. So there you want to loosen up all the strings enough to get the tension off the tailpiece. You're going to maybe take a little piece of wood or, um, you know, something that's not going to scratch your tailpiece at all, um, that you can put up against the edge and you can just gently tap a little bit and that'll help loosen it up after all that tension that's been on there. Um, that'll help loosen it up enough to be able to unhook it from those hooks and then you can just lift that tailpiece assembly up out of the way. Um, that's how it's designed. You might not be comfortable doing that. I get it, right? So in that case, yeah, you pretty much got to take the strings off. Um, in any event, we're going to get the strings up and off. And uh, here, I'll just show you on this one basically how easy that is. So you're going to loosen the string enough with enough slack to be able to pull it back. And we're out. Do it five more times. We'll let our strings hang off. I would recommend that you hang the bottom three strings, obviously off the bottom side, the top three off the top side. And you can, you can cinch them up together underneath, um, out of your way and just to keep them from, you know, sort of flying all over the place while you're doing your work. So you could cinch them up with some string or a rubber band or a piece of tape or something, all right? And very important to remember that this bridge is a floating bridge, right? It's not fixed to the guitar. It just sits on that metal plate. So, of course, that's going to come flying right off of there. So you want to just tuck that safely away, far from harm, and we'll bring it back when we need it. And And there we are, the famous Rickenbacker dual truss rod system. Behold. So this is a good chance, if you've never taken the truss rod cover off, um, it's a good chance to, you know, look at it, make sure there's no oxidation or, of course, you know, any issues with the, um, the truss rod or the, uh, the retainer. Um, make sure there's nothing living in there. Um, but 
as I get a look under that dresser cover, obviously I can see that it looks like a couple bits of the layer of paint on the back have uh, adhered to the headstock and peeled right away from the dresser cover. Now the fact that those pieces are stuck down at the nut end and that I know this nut has been taken off and re-glued on uh, doesn't look good for the near future. Uh, my guess is, of course, in re-gluing it, whoever did it used way too much glue uh, or was careless and let the glue either squeeze out or drip out, um, of course, adjacent to the nut. And uh, that's why those pieces stuck on there. Um, so I'm actually going to be replacing that truss rod cover. So I'm going to want to go ahead and chisel those bits off. But anyway, I'm not going to make you sit through that. We'll deal with that later. Um, important thing is, uh, you know, some guys will say, well, it's easy. You just tap the nut off. Well, I mean, you could do that, but a couple things here. Um, this gives us a chance, and especially in this case, when I know the nut has been re-glued, um, this gives us a chance to get to all the joints of that nut to the wood. And I want to go ahead and cut those. I want to cut a little seam at each join where the nut is meeting the wood. I um, want to do that on all sides. So here across, uh, you know, the face of the headstock, um, here at the bed with the neck, here where the side meets the end of the fingerboard, but not here on the front. Um, I want to preserve the edge of that fingerboard, the wood, the integrity as much as humanly possible. That is critical to this nut fitting at the proper point for proper intonation. If you change the distance of that nut to that fingerboard end at all, you are compromising the ability to intonate your guitar properly. And that's a bad thing. Um, so <laughs> I don't want to touch that. Uh, if at all possible. So hopefully I won't need to. Now to make those cuts you can either use a fresh razor blade or an X-Acto knife with a number 11 blade. And that kind of depends on the type of guitar you're working on. Um, so remember we were talking about the way the Gibson nut is seated uh, and the way the fender nut is seated compared to the way this Rickenbacker nut is seated. Um, so the advantage of the straight razor blade is that you've got a long edge and it's fairly stiff because of the spine, right? So you can more efficiently run it along that long surface and score your cut, right? The disadvantage is, for example, on a Gibson or a Gibson style guitar, you remember we looked at the picture and um, you remember that in that case, the nut sat in a channel that scored between the um, the fingerboard and the top wood of the headstock. So you've got wood on three sides. So the disadvantage of a long blade is it's going to be really hard to make that cut and not cut into the wood on one or all of those three sides. Um, so that's where the advantage is with the number 11 blade is you've got that nice sharp pointed tip, you can control your cut and where you stop it without risking cutting, you know, the wood adjacent, right? Um, same thing with the fender. It's got a, a channel 
a slot that's routed through the fingerboard material. And, you know, you want to avoid making, you know, extra cuts into your wood. So having this allows you to make your cuts precisely and control them where they stop, right? And of course, you always want to be cutting away from the guitar, away from the wood. So, you know, make sure you position everything so that you can do that. And so, what I want to do here is just lightly score. And then you can go back, once you've done your initial light score, you can go back in and cut a little bit deeper. You just don't want to be pressing too hard and risk, you know, cutting a divot into the wood. Um, you just want to separate the lacquer top coat. I should mention that because, especially from the factory, um, those nuts are installed before, at least I believe on most guitars, before they spray the lacquer top coat on the guitar. So that seam is actually underneath a layer of lacquer. If you just dive right in and tap that nut off, you know, of course, you are going to break that lacquer who knows where, and you're going to end up with a chip in the lacquer. And, uh, you know, if you care, it's going to look like hell and it's going to bug you. Um, so again, you know, take the time just to go along and cut a score that'll separate the bond of the lacquer so that it separates cleanly without any chipping. There we go. Here, I'm just gonna go ahead and use my razor blade just to show you how I do that. Yeah, I mean, looking at this, there is way too much glue on this nut. And that means we're going to have some fun times ahead. Okay. So part of the adventure of doing these videos on the fly like this is I forgot to show you taking measurements of your existing nut that can help you um, down the road as reference for your new blank and you know cutting that to size. Um, now to do that, to take all those measurements, it is best to have the strings on. So I went ahead and threw them back on. Um, the first measurement you're going to want to take though is the overall dimensions of the nut um, to make sure you get the right size blank. Um, so you can use a ruler for those measurements. Um, you know, I do again recommend you're getting a ruler that's at least marked in 30 seconds or even 60 fourths. And it's a good idea to take the measurements in metric as well, because if you aren't sure the source of the blank that you're going to get, um, you know, the company might give measurements in inches, it might give them in, in, in millimeters. So um, it's good to note them down, you know, both of them, so that you're covered either way. Now, the ruler is good if you have access to flat sides um of the surface but of course if you're trying to measure a three-dimensional object and especially if that object has rounded edges or corners like this then the ruler can be a little bit vague as to you know where exactly you're lining it up um, that's where having the calipers is really handy because even with the strings on if i can't get a ruler down to the flat side of that knot to measure the width, then obviously the beauty of this is that I can just 
close it up on the outside and I got my measurement. Um, you know, plus I spent my 20 bucks on it on Amazon, so might as well get the equity. For the thickness, it's especially easy with the calipers. So all I have to do is put one end up against the front side of the nut, close the other one up against the back side, and I've got my thickness. And then for height, you can use the outside part of it, and that's handy, because there all you need to do is find the right position. So all you need to do is rest one of the guides against the top of the neck surface, you know, the bed, as we say, and then raise up the other. And you can even take a straight edge as your stop guide. Just since there's a little bit of roll off to the edge of the nut, this way I've got a straight line. And just get it where it makes contact like that. And I know my height. So of course, when you go to order your blank, um, you know, just make sure that it matches um, no smaller than any of those measurements, right? Of course, because you can always cut and sand or file down your blank, but it's really challenging to add material back on. And now we want to go ahead and measure the string spacing. So if you've got a string spacing rule or you use uh, one of the online string spacing calculators, um, and I've included a couple links to, you know, what seem to be really reliable ones in the description. So check those out. Um, if you're using either of those, then really the most important measurement you need is the distance between the bottom E and top E strings. So you'd want to measure the center point of the bottom E across to the top E. And that's pretty much all you need, because um, if you remember from part one, and I showed you how this works, as long as you line it up so that the base side is oriented on the base side and treble on the treble, um, on your new blank, all you'll need to do is line up the space of the bottom E to the top E that you took. It's already set to fill in the other four strings proportionally distanced, right? We talked about that in part one too. Um, proportionally distanced, and then all you have to do is just make marks and Bob's your uncle. Um, same thing with the calculators. Um, the online calculators, uh, I think, generally ask you the distance of the outside E strings. Um, now, if you're working from scratch, uh, in that case, we generally go from the outside edge of the nut to the center of the bottom E and the outside of the nut to the, the top E. Um, and the general rule of thumb for that space is an eighth of an inch. But that being said, you want to note how your frets are beveled, how deep does that bevel go in to the neck, to the, sorry, to the fingerboard surface? Um, or maybe it's, you know, cut very, very shallow and it barely encroaches onto the fingerboard surface. Um, that's important because depending again on a lot of things, the gauge of your strings, uh, the, your, your playing touch, um, how much you bend, um, you want to be real careful how close you're getting that string to the edge of that bevel because you could get roll off, right? So that eighth of an inch is a good rule of thumb, but 
I would say always check it against how much space you've got to the bevel of the uh, frets. And I'd check a few frets up along the way, you know, maybe obviously the first fret, fifth fret, seventh, twelfth, um, and just get a distance that you think is a good compromise. And then, of course, once you've got that, then all you need to do is measure, again, the inside of what's left. Because once you take the outside margin to the outer ease, now you're left with that space. And then those tools will do the rest of the work for you. Now, if for whatever reason you don't have a string spacing rule or calipers, um, you can still go a grassroots method that's pretty reliable and take a business card or even a piece of uh, carton from a food container. Um, these are just about the right thickness and weight um, just to hold up so you can hang on to them for a while. You want to slip that under the strings over the fingerboard right up against the front side of the nut. And remember we call the fingerboard side of the nut the front side and then the headstock is the back side. So you're going to put that and just hold it down with your finger so it doesn't slide left or right. And then you want to take a mechanical pencil and for this I would suggest you get um, uh, a 0.5 millimeter mechanical pencil. You want to have as narrow a point as possible. And you're going to go in and first you're just going to mark the edges of the nut or fingerboard. So you've got a reference. And then you're going to go and as tightly as you can up against each string, you're going to mark the outline of the string. And again, as tight as you can possibly get it. And of course now, with all of your strings outlined, you'll go in and you'll mark the center point. And this is why it's good to have that really narrow, fine point on your mechanical pencil. Right, so you go along, mark the center points, and now you've got a pretty faithful reference to your current string spacing. So you can, you know, use that when you're lining up the slots on your new nut blank or take it to your tech um, for his reference and, you know, tell him, hey, I like it just like this or I'd like it a little bit wider or narrower or whatever. And if you want to take the measurement from the outside edge of the nut to the outside E strings on your current nut, and especially if the edges have rounded off. That's where it can be really handy to have the carpenter square or that square cut block of wood like we said in part one. Um, I really like this square again because it's got that flat side edge where you can stand it up and it's perfect for just sliding up against the edge of the nut and I can just let it stand there. And then you can come in with your ruler and you've got a nice clean reference edge there that you can measure up to. So again, going from the center of the bottom string to the edge of the square. And then of course on the top side, the string is so narrow, you just get right over it. Um, if you have your calipers, then this is a good time to use the outside teeth. There we go. And again, you'll just hold the carpenter square nice and steady. You're going to put the one tip of the calipers up against the edge of the square. And then, of course, roll the other one until it's right over the center of that bottom string. And you've got your measurement. 
and of course in metric or inches. So again, pretty handy. And then of course, same thing for the top side. Okay, let's recap. We've checked that the frets are level. We've determined the appropriate amount of relief. We've taken all the measurements that are useful to us on our old nut to transfer over to the new one. And we've got the strings off the guitar and it's securely in the vise for the moment we've all been waiting for, taking off the old nut. Um, you can also see that I like to put a piece of rubber, some sort of rubber mat underneath the uh, tail end side just to hold that steady, grip it from sliding around at all. Although if you've got a good sturdy vise, that should take care of most of holding it nice and steady. So this part has gone a little bit longer than I planned, but I think it's worth taking a couple extra minutes at this stage for a bit of a public service announcement because the sight or mention of a hammer around your guitar might make some folks wince. And that's a good common sense reaction. There are only two times when a hammer should get anywhere near your guitar, and that's either to tap the nut off or to relic your guitar either intentionally or unintentionally. So I'm not saying that maintenance is for everyone. Um, there are times when I think it's a great idea to take your guitar to a tech, especially if it's something that you feel is way beyond your comfort level or takes special equipment that isn't practical for you to go out and buy. Um, and, you know, I certainly appreciate it when people bring their guitars to me um, because that's how I make some of my money. So there are definitely times to do that. But I also think there is some maintenance that's pretty accessible and I think it's within the reach of most folks. So when I see folks saying, oh, you should, you know, never, never mess with your guitar, take it to your tech, they know what they're doing, you know, it takes special skills. Well, I think that skill comes down to 50% practice and the other half being equal parts continuous research and learning and just plain forethought. So anytime you take a hammer to your guitar, that's a good moment to pause and reflect. And before I do any work on a guitar, I always take a good look and anticipate what could go wrong and how to ideally avoid it or deal with it if something does go south. And the situation with this guitar especially presents us with a good cautionary tale. Now, we saw that the nut was cracked all the way around and looking at the height of that crack and the height of the truss rod cover, I could figure out pretty quickly what had happened. Um, now, you might see a lot of folks recommending that the way to tap the nut off is with a block of wood and you take the hammer and you hit it from the front side of the nut. And that is not the way to do it. And there is a whole list of reasons why not. So. Let's look at them. First of all, the level of that crack and the level of the truss rod cover line up perfectly, which tells me it cracked forward at the resistance point, that fulcrum point of the truss rod cover. But potentially much worse than that, if there is too much glue on the nut and you can't really be sure you can hope for the best but i think it's better to expect the worst if there's too much glue and you do go ahead and tap the nut from the front side you got to remember that most glue is stronger than wood and wood tears along its grain and that is a wicked combination especially in this case because if that glue holds to the wood, the wood is gonna give away by its grain 
And guess where that wood and that grain are? And that is that point that you want to keep so pristine. So those are two reasons why it's a really, really bad idea. I mean, plus the chance of sending the nut skittering across the top of the headstock, you could scratch it up. I mean, there's just no good outcome to that, really. It's much, much safer to tap the nut from the side. And by doing that, you're clearing any resistance of the truss rod cover on a rig or, you know, like we saw on the Gibson or on the Fender, you've got some kind of wood ridge coming up there. So you're avoiding damaging that wood ridge, which is also important to guiding and retaining the nut in place. You're using a shearing force to cut across the grain. And if you think about it, the grain lines up this way. And so as you look from the far side to your near side, all that wood grain is supporting itself as you go along. So when you tap and put the force from this side, you've got a fair amount of support and resistance in the wood to resist any kind of tearing out along the grain as the nut comes off. And that is simply the way to do it. And again, you know, thinking ahead um, and how to avoid any issues. So you can see that first of all, I've put the truss rod cover back on the headstock. And that's because I want it to act as that sort of retaining wall and create that channel alongside the backside of the nut so that it's going to act as a guide as the nut travels off and away from the guitar. And of course, on a Gibson style or Fender style guitar, you'll have some wood there of the headstock or of the fingerboard to do that for you. You'll also notice that I wrapped up layers of tape, maybe two or three layers of low tack tape all around the seams. And that's of course to protect the area of the headstock and the truss rod cover immediately around the nut. Um, but it also protects the finish and even the wood grain, just in case my wood block happens to skip off and go off to the side. Also to help support that grain and hold it down just in case there was any chance of it lifting out again if there's too much glue. But, you know, for most guitars from the factory, you're going to have minimal glue. One firm tap is going to send that nut clean off and you really shouldn't have any problems. Okay, the moment of truth. So if you have somebody helping you out with this, then you want to have them standing on the opposite side of the guitar from you. Um, so depending on whether you're going to be on the top side or on the bottom string side, um, whether you're right-handed, left-handed, you're set up at uh, where you are, However, that is, you want to have them standing on the opposite side. You want them to grip the neck firmly with both hands, um, one at the top, one at the bottom. Um, it will help to have a rubber mat or some kind of rubber surface underneath the body of the guitar, just to grip it and help hold it steady um, so that all they have to do is focus on keeping that neck steady against your tap. Um, if it's just you, then like I say, I highly recommend a good bench vise and make sure the vise is firmly bolted down to a surface. Uh, in this case, I've uh, bolted mine onto like about two inches of uh, plywood. So that makes it nice and portable and then I can clamp it down wherever I go. 
um, and make sure you do have it firmly, securely clamped to whatever surface you're working on. And um, we're pretty much ready to go. So at this point, whatever you're going to use to transfer the strike into the nut, um, you want to make sure that you have it up against the body of the nut and especially a little bit more at the base because of course that's where your glue is. Um, but be careful that you don't have it too far down against the neck wood, right? Um, and that's another good reason to have the tape. So, you know, the tape of course helps protect the wood and the finish. Um, but it also kind of gives you a little guide and a little border there that makes it a lot easier to read where you are. So now I know I'm not on the neck, I'm right on the nut. And normally, it would only take one or two sharp, short taps, and especially if you're using a dead blow hammer, like this um, fretting hammer. Um, because remember, with this, all of your energy is transferred forward. There's no recoil with these. Um, so it's, it's a bit more force than you might normally get with like a ball peen hammer, which tends to bounce back and you lose a little bit of the energy. Um, that being said, uh, we already know that this nut has way too much glue and it's been cracked before. So I got to think about that. Um, I want to be a little more tentative, I think, with my taps, um, because of course, with all that glue, if I strike it too hard or I force too much, uh, a lot of bad things can happen to that wood. So I'm going to be a little more tentative. I'm still going to give it one or two sharp taps and see what happens. If I need a third or a fourth, I will, but I'm never going to wail on this thing. Um, if it doesn't come out with four firm, just sort of normal strength taps, then we're putting down the hammer and we're going to look at some other methods. But let's hope for the best. It's always hope for the best, plan for the worst, right? Okay, as expected, we got the top half out. But you can probably see that we still have the bottom half in there. Um, I think the camera can see it. There's the top of the bottom piece of nut. And that's going to be a little stubborn. Now, I'll take a tap at it and try to get it out, but um, it's not looking good. In fact, I think for that one, we're going to go over to that golf tee that I fashioned uh, back in part one, because it's a little bit narrower tip, and that's what I need, something a little more precise at this point. Okay, so this is that golf tee I talked about in part one, and I just filed down the tip a little bit so that it wasn't a sharp pointed tip. Uh, got a little bit more blunt, and I'm going to try to rest it on the truss rod cover side of the neck because I'm replacing that truss rod cover anyway. I don't really care about it. It's plexi. I think it's going to take a hit a lot better than Bubinga fingerboard wood um, or certainly uh, maple. So I am going to rest because I can feel that that nut when it was glued in kind of a little bit 
off the edge here. So it actually gives me a little ledge to sit on, which is a good thing. So I'm going to rest it up against that a little bit more towards the truss rod cover side. And we'll give this another shot. And this is where what Robbie O'Brien calls the pucker factor starts to climb a little bit. But that's not really going to go anywhere. Okay, we're going to regroup and be back in a minute. Okay, we're back. After a moment of railing against the fates, questioning our direction in life, and finally reaching reconciliation. Um, so first, most important, um, I don't want this to discourage you in any way from taking on this job. Um, remember that 99% of the time, if you're working on your guitar from the factory, it only has a couple of dabs of glue on there. The nut is going to come off just as easily as you saw it come off with that one or two strikes with the hammer. Um, that being said, I'm going to look at this rare occasion as glass half full. Um, so if anyone does run into this kind of problem and you come across the video and you'd like to see how I do that, um, then put a comment below and if enough people or even just a few people say they'd like to see how we do that, then um, we'll work that out as maybe. Um, so I'll let the camera roll for that while I'm doing it, but I'm not going to put it in this video, of course. Um, but for those who have morbid curiosity, um, before I go away and spend a day on this, uh, I'll tell you exactly how we're going to take care of that. So actually this answers a question that a bunch of people have asked me in the past too. Um, and that is, um, should you apply heat to the nut in any case, should you apply heat to the nut? thinking that that's going to help to soften up the glue and make it easier to get off. Well, um, my answer, and I think it's going to be the same answer you'll get from any reputable tech, is no. Um, reason for that, first of all, like I said, the glue on there should be so minimal that it's a waste of time. It's going to come off with, a, with just a firm tap. Um, if you have a ton of glue like this does, um, a couple of things are going to happen. You're going to need to apply so much heat that it's probably going to transfer through the nut to the finish and even down to the wood surface around it, right? And that's going to risk burning the finish and even down into the wood of your guitar. And you don't want to do that. Plus, if you do have a ton of glue, um, now you're just going to have a melted gooey glue mess that you've got to clean up and scrape off a ton of residue. And that's not a lot of fun either. I would much rather cut and chip or chisel away old dried glue. Um, it should flake and chip away easily 
with the right tools. So what are the tools? Well, I haven't really been in this kind of situation before, but um, looking at it and knowing what I'm in for, it makes sense to me that I'll try at first to take a hobby knife. This is where it's good, it's handy to have like an eight inch hobby knife. Um, and I'm gonna, of course, first of all, tape up the end of that fingerboard. I might even put a piece of paper behind the tape just to protect that surface and keep it clean and safe um, while I'm doing work around it. So then I will come in and I'll try to make one or even two vertical cuts down, not all the way to the wood, um, but just enough to weaken that up a bit and hopefully get it into some separate sections that are easier to chisel off. Um, my other options are, and you're getting into some specialized tools here. Uh, I know that, but I've been doing this for a long time and I've acquired a lot over the way. So triangle file, this is ideal for the situation. Um, so I can try filing down a fair amount of that. Again, I wanna be very, very careful. I'll probably even tape the surface of the wood. Um, I don't wanna file all the way to the wood. I just wanna file as much the bulk of that material away as I can, just to leave a minimum for chiseling later. Um, and the nice thing about the triangle file is that it's going to be angled, of course, away from the end of my fingerboard. So that's, that's a really good protection for the fingerboard, right? Um, a fret file also. Same thing, very, very, very handy. Um, it's used for filing down the ends of metal frets, so very, very durable. This ivory should give way possibly even more easily than the nickel of these frets. Um, and again, it's a triangle profile, so it's angled away from the wood. It's also narrower, so there's a lot less risk of hitting the headstock end. Um, I'm still not going to go all the way down. I just want to get as much of the material off. So I'm going to get some strong light like I've got here. And just make sure that that shadow line doesn't disappear. That I've always got a shadow line because that tells me as long as I have a shadow, I'm above the surface. So that helps me read and gauge how far down to go. Um, once I've got the bulk of that off, then we're getting down to chisel work. Um, so a half inch, maybe even a three quarter inch chisel, well honed, well sharpened and honed, um, should make short work of that. So you just wanna go along very carefully, progressively, and we're going to go ahead and chisel away. And again, that's why old dried glue should chip up and lift up easily under a well, well sharpened chisel blade. So um, that's what we're going to do. That's the safest way to address it. And um, we'll go away and do that. It's probably going to be about a day's worth of work if I'm very, very careful about it. And uh, when we come back, we should have a nice clean bed for our new nut. And that'll be part three. So see you then, folks.